Hey everyone, it's Pacific. As always, just a few quick notes before I jump into this week's episode. First and foremost, I want to give a big shout out to our patrons. Thanks to you, we were able to hire more actors to record additional addendums, so this week is our largest episode to date. So, thank you. Because of you, we're able to create more, which is what we love to do. And this week's patrons are Nicholas Tolson, DJ, Deathster, Moray, Anthony Sade, Charlie Stewart, F. Cole Serrano, Michael Janes, Ryan C., and Exec Rabelis. And if you're interested in hearing your name at the beginning of an episode, or getting ad-free episodes or bonus content, find us at patreon.com slash scp underscore pod. Enjoy. Warning. The Foundation database is classified. Unauthorized access will result in detainment. Within this archive, you'll find the procedures, descriptions, and accounts of the most notorious anomalies we've encountered to date. Secure. Contain. Protect. Item number. SCP-106. Object class. Keter. Special containment procedures. Revision 11-8. No physical interaction with SCP-106 is allowed at any time. All physical interactions must be approved by no less than two-thirds vote from O5 Command. Any such interaction must be undertaken in AR-11 maximum security sites after a general non-essential staff evacuation. All staff, research, security, Class D, etc. are to remain at least 60 meters away from the containment cell at all times, except in the event of breach events. SCP-106 is to be contained in a sealed container comprised of lead-lined steel. The container to be sealed within 40 layers of identical material, each layer separated by no less than 36 centimeters of empty space. Sports struts between layers are to be randomly spaced. Containers remain suspended no less than 60 centimeters from any surface by ELO 11D electromagnetic supports. Secondary containment area is to be comprised of 16 spherical cells each filled with various fluids and a random assembly of surfaces and supports. Secondary containment is to be fitted with light systems, capable of flooding the entire assembly with no less than 80,000 lumens of light instantly with no direct human involvement. Both containment areas are to remain under 24-hour surveillance. Any corrosion observed on any containment cell surfaces, staff members, or other site locations within 200 meters of SCP-106 are to be reported to site security immediately. Any objects or personnel lost to SCP-106 are to be deemed missing or KIA. No recovery attempts are to be made under any circumstances. Note. Continued research and observation have shown that when faced with highly complex or random assemblies of structures, SCP-106 can be confused, showing a marked delay on entry and exit from said structure. SCP-106 also has shown an aversion to direct sudden light. This is not manifested in any form of physical damage, but a rapid exit into the pocket dimension generated on solid surfaces. These observations, along with those of lead aversion and liquid confusion, have reduced the general escape incidents by 43%. The primary cells have also been effective in recovery incidents requiring recall protocol... Dash... Dash... Observation is ongoing. Description. SCP-106 appears to be an elderly humanoid with a general appearance of advanced decomposition. This appearance may vary but the rotting quality is observed in all forms. SCP-106 is not exceptionally agile and will remain motionless for days at a time waiting for prey. SCP-106 is also capable of scaling any vertical surface and can remain suspended upside down indefinitely. When attacking, SCP-106 will attempt to incapacitate prey by damaging major organs, muscle groups, or tendons, then pull disabled prey into its pocket dimension. SCP-106 appears to prefer human prey items in the 10 to 25 years of age bracket. SCP-106 causes a corrosion effect in all solid matter it touches, engaging a physical breakdown in material several seconds after contact. This is observed as rusting, rotting, and cracking of materials, 
in the creation of a black mucus-like substance similar to material coating SCP-106. This effect is particularly detrimental to living tissues and is assumed to be a pre-digestion action. Corrosion continues for six hours after contact, after which the effect appears to burn out. SCP-106 is capable of passing through solid matter, leaving behind a large patch of its corrosive mucus. SCP-106 is able to vanish inside solid matter, entering what is assumed to be a form of pocket dimension. SCP-106 is then able to exit this dimension from any point connected to the initial entry point. Examples Entering the inner wall of a room and exiting the outer wall. Entering a wall and exiting from the ceiling. It is unknown if this is the point of origin for SCP-106, or simply a layer created by SCP-106. Limited observation of this pocket dimension is shown to be comprised mostly of halls and rooms, with entry. This activity can continue for days, with some subjected individuals being released for the express purposes of hunting, recapture, Nobody could like Corporal Lawrence. That's not to say that nobody tried, or that he was somehow unfriendly. Merely that he was one of those few that seemed to be wired differently. However, in the trenches of World War I, normalcy was at best a relative term, and one that had minimal relation of life such as it was. Lawrence fought, listened to orders, and didn't disrupt the other soldiers and that was all that was required. So what if people felt increasingly uncomfortable around him? In a place where the flesh rotting off your bones while you were still alive was the baseline of concern, a little personality conflict ranked several levels below a paper cut. Lawrence, for his part, dealt with it as he always had. That is to say, remained totally unaware of the avoidance. The same way a man blind from birth cannot mourn the memory of color, Corporal Lawrence couldn't bemoan a lack of company. He was quiet, as he had nobody to talk to, and still, as he had nothing to do for long stretches of time. The enemy trench, less than a mile away, had gone silent for several days, letting boredom and nervousness sink in even more than normal coupled with the unease that seemed to radiate off of Lawrence like heat waves. The worst part was that there was no distinct reason to dislike the corporal. He was a plain man, average height, average build, bland of voice and action. Nobody could recall him raising his voice in joy or anger. He did have the occasional odd mannerisms, however, he tended to stare a beat or two longer than was acceptable at people. He rarely slept as well, and bunkmates said he would mumble in his sleep almost constantly. The content of those nocturnal ramblings, when they could be understood, were often odd and potentially unsettling. One private moved to another barracks when he heard the name of his daughter pass Corporal Lawrence's lips, followed by a bubbling, muffled giggle. It was strongly theorized that he was sent over the trench by his commanders more out of a desire to have him away than for his minimal combat skill. He and 14 of his fellows were sent across the nightmarishly scarred waste of the no man's land between the trenches to reconnoiter the enemy trench and secure it if possible. Many seemed to hope that Lawrence would have the opportunity to prove his devotion to his country by making the ultimate sacrifice for it. It was while he was gone that three-day gap as the men held their breath, waiting for a surprise volley of shells, that someone started asking questions. Whereas before, it was almost taboo to speak of Corporal Lawrence. Since the departure of both him and his aura, rumors seemed to descend with the passion of the denied. Nobody remembered him ever talking of home. 
No sweet-smelling letters came. No soggy, dirt-streaked letters left. He mentioned his dreams often, and griped sometimes with the men over missed foods or pleasures, but never with any real passion. Questions started to float among even the higher levels of the command. Nobody was able to actually find his station orders. He'd come in with a squad of reinforcements transferred from France, but there was no paperwork. The rest of the reinforcement squad had never seen the man before he'd been lumped in with them the night before the trip, along with the snips and scraps of other squads decimated by the Germans. Whispers filtered among the grunts of the corporal being a curse. Nearly every man who'd shared a bunkhouse with him had gotten trench foot, and the rooms he haunted always seemed to smell more musty and sickly sweet, even for the trench. The men sent over the no man's land with Corporal Lawrence heard and cared for none of this. Just another man among many, all with death certificates awaiting a stamp that could fall at any moment. They moved fast and low, from crater to crater, slipping over slick mud and barbed wire, the only thing that seemed to grow in that blasted waste. Charging the last spurt and into the trench, they were greeted not with the harsh bark of German orders and rifles, but a dense, close silence. Preparing for ambush, the men started to filter out into the tunnels and halls of the trench. The men, already nervous, were not calmed by their investigation. The trenches stank of mold, sweat, and a thin undertaste of rotten fruit. A vile, Cloying slime seemed to have pooled in every divot and crack, sticky as glue and itchy on the flesh. In a world where rats and insects would try to snatch food from your mouth even as you ate, they saw nothing alive, not so much as a fly. An armory lay in chaos, munitions spilled on the ground, rifles tossed like pickup sticks. A mess hall had been reduced to ruins, the tables and chairs piled in the center of the room, charred and twisted, the rations seemingly stamped into the dirt by many feet, and still nothing, alive or dead, was found by the increasingly anxious soldiers. Private Dixon found the first body, and managed to cry out before vomiting. They knew it had been a man, only because nothing else of that size could have been there. It lay on the floor of a barracks. The entire floor. The flesh of it had been... smeared, somehow. Spread like butter over the rough dirt floor. Bones, already looking pitted and rotten, stuck out at random angles like dead trees in a still swamp. The skull rested on one of the highest bunks, facing the doorway, ten gleaming white fingertip bones crammed into the cracked eye sockets. As one of the men went to examine it, he found the back of the skull had been crushed open, the rotting, sagging sponge of a tongue stuffed into the otherwise dry cavity. More remains were found each seemingly more unsettling and strange than the last. A ring of hands in a sandbagged watch post. Ten of them, fingers interlaced like a basket, the wrists ragged and broken. Two men in a tunnel, skin leathery and thin as mummies, eye sockets staring and empty, mouths locked impossibly wide, their clothes mere rags under an oily black scum. The latrine sent even the hardest back, gagging and shivering. Overflowing with excrement and awful, gobbets of meat bobbed and oozed in the foul sludge. The whole surface dotted with what looked like thousands of clean, slick eyeballs, nerves and tendons fanning out like goldfish tails. Corporal Lawrence was the first to find the hole the other men loudly debating the better part of valor and their rapid withdrawal from the Nightmare Trench. 
It was small, in a section of fresh digging, the start of a new arm of trenches projecting closer to the enemy lines. No more than four feet across, it seemed to be the accidental uncovering of a natural chamber, the empty blackness of it defying investigation. Private Dixon, recovered and blessedly numb from his previous ordeals, saw the corporate prod the edge with his boot, then crouch to peer in. Then, suddenly, slide in, head first, before the private could so much as utter a shout of question. The private was a good soldier, and rushed to the perceived distress of his fellow. When questioned later, he could provide little illumination as to what happened over the two minutes Corporal Lawrence spent in the hole. He could see nothing, the light of a torch seemingly gobbled up a few feet into that dense blackness. There were sounds, the rustle of movement over loose stone or rubble, an odd liquid shifting, a dry rustle that made him think of the insect husks he'd used to collect in the summer. As he shouted for aid, there was a sudden upwelling of a repulsive stench, like a reptile house gone sour and old, and his fellow soldiers found him retching helplessly beside the hole when they came around the turn. It was as they rushed to Private Dixon's aid that the hand emerged from the hole. They stopped and raised rifles as one body, roaring for the owner of that pale, trembling hand to identify himself. As they watched, another hand joined the first, followed by the pale, shivering head of Corporal Lawrence. He was streaked and smeared with a tarry black ooze, hacking and coughing thinly as he hauled his body up beside that of the gasping private. As they moved to help the man, the corporal vomited up a heavy stream of the same repulsive slime that coated his body in smears and globs, his curled, shuddering body voiding more of it into his saturated, fouled pants. They were hesitant to touch him, doing so after the seemingly endless river of grime stopped pouring from him. He was insensible, eyes rolling and wide, body as limp as a boned fish. The men quit the trench with all speed. Half dragging the corporal, they ran, with no thought to cover or death, only escape. They crossed in record time, falling into their home trench like so much cordwood, gasping and shivering. One man known to have bludgeoned a German to death with a brick, curled on the floor in a sobbing heap. The commanders moved quickly, isolating the men and trying to calm the most lucid for a report. What spilled out would have been immediately dismissed as lies and hallucination, were it not for the earnest, pleading stares of those reporting. Command calmed them with explanations of battle fatigue and strange gas weapon tests, and shared silent, focused stares as the cowed men were ushered out. Corporal Lawrence had little to report. Of his time in the hole, he could, or would, say little. He stated that he had slipped and fallen into what may have been some long-blocked underground pool, or perhaps a buried latrine. Of the sounds and smells reported by the private, he had nothing to say, only that he had struggled a short time, then managed to get back out just as the men arrived. Truly, he seemed none the worse for wear. In fact, he seemed in better spirits than many had remembered ever seeing him, favoring the commanders with a wide, giddy smile as he was dismissed with a warning not to discuss the events. The corporal proved a changed man over the next few days. He was more talkative, but quickly had men wishing for his old unsettling silence. He rambled about the joys of close spaces, of creation and destruction that seemed to spring up all around them, about human pleasures missed, the dimensions and ages of which made some men threaten Corporal Lawrence with a quiet and ignoble death which only seemed to stretch the near-constant smile on his face even wider. Private Dixon, one of the corporal's bunkmates, 
whispered to a friend that he had woken once to find the corporal standing over him in the night, his eyes as bright and flat as silver dollars. They found the private the next day, snarled in the barbed wire, his intestines spread nearly ten feet around him in every direction. Not one man from that trench survived the Great War, although few died in battle. A wave of sickness took the trench a few days after Private Dixon's death. A strange, wasting sickness. It seemed to eat the flesh like acid, men waking to find previously healthy flesh eaten down to the bone, oozing and blackened. A sergeant was found in a latrine, beset by a living carpet of rats. They refused to quit the body even when shot and attacked several men before the body was recovered. Relief finally came, the bulk of the men being sent to various hospitals, many wasting away before they ever reached a bed. Corporal Lawrence was remanded to a French mental ward, transferred after several complaints from the hospital proper where he was first sent. It seemed his behavior hinted at a growing mental imbalance, culminating with an attempted sexual assault of a nurse, which ended with the loss of three fingers from her right hand and the vision in her right eye. The corporal would rant endlessly to the other patients, whispers about endless halls, pursuits in the dark, flesh laid out like pages of a book. It was dismissed as so much war fatigue, even as his behavior grew less violent and more unsettling. He vanished several times from the ward, only to appear several hours later as if nothing had happened. When pressed, he would begin to sing, My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, in an endless monotone until the doctors left, exasperated. Others on the ward clamored to be transferred from the whispering madman. A stale, musty foulness seemed to sit in the air wherever he stayed, an incidence of infection and the strange, consuming sickness that had beset his home trench seemed to follow him like a cloud. Numerous attempts were made to transfer the man, only to be met with bureaucratic confusion. No records were found of the man. No entry papers, commendations or incidents, not even a birth certificate. Through it all, he sat, for hours on end, cross-legged on his bed, occasionally humming tunelessly, or rambling off the names of his wardmates between short, bubbling giggles. Corporal Lawrence and 18 men vanished one November night, between a five-minute nurse rotation at three in the morning. The room reeked of rust, oil, mold, and sweet rot. Thin black swaths of crumbling ooze coated the beds and several of the walls, wide patches of it smearing and eating into the floor. Of the men, there was no sign at first. As they searched, one nurse shifted a bed aside, only to shriek and nearly trip across one of the sunken, reeking depressions on the floor. In a tight, perfect spiral were what appeared to be hundreds of teeth resting neatly on the floor. After counting, they accounted for the total of all the teeth of every living soul in that ward but one. The corporal was never found, nor were the men. The incident was swallowed by the constant barrage of horrors from the front and forgotten with ease. Stories of a cursed trench wandered across the front lines, often squelched for being bad luck. Still, they came. Stories of strange deaths, of disappearing men found days later alive but broken and twisted beyond comprehension. Stories of a strange, dark figure stalking the bomb-riddled town of Europe. Addendum. SCP Review Notes. 
Due to the exceedingly difficult to contain nature of SCP-106, SCP is to be reviewed every three months or during a post-breach incident. Physical restraints are impossible, and direct physical damage appears to have no effect on SCP-106. Current SCP, as of 24, revolves around basic observation and immediate response. Previous, more proactive special containment procedures have been recalled due to the events of breaches and Notes on Behavior SCP-106 appears to go through long periods of dormancy, in which it will remain completely motionless for up to three months. The cause of this is unknown. However, it has been shown that this appears to be used as a lulling tactic. SCP-106 will emerge from this state in a very agitated state, and will attack and abduct staff and cause gross damage to its containment cell and the site at large. Recall Protocol SCP-106 appears to hunt and attack based on desire, not hunger. SCP-106 will attack and collect multiple prey items during a hunting behavior event, keeping many alive in the pocket dimension for extended periods of time. SCP-106 has no determinable limit and appears to collect a random number of prey items during an event. The inner dimension accessed by SCP-106 appears to be only accessible by SCP-106. Recording and transmission devices have been shown to still operate inside this dimension. The recordings and transmissions are very degraded. It appears that SCP-106 will play with captured prey, and appears to have full control of time, space, and perception inside this dimension. SCP-106 appears... Recall Protocol 50-B. In the event of a breach event by SCP-106, a human within the 10 to 25 years of age bracket will be prepped for recall, with the compromised containment cell being replaced and restored for use. When the cell is ready, the lure subject will be injured, preferably via the breakage of a long bone, such as the femur, or the severing of a major tendon, such as the Achilles tendon. Lore subject will then be placed in the prepped cell, and the sound emitted by said subject will be transmitted over the site public address system. SCP-106 will typically begin to gravitate toward the lore subject within 10 to 15 minutes after hearing the subject. Should SCP-106 not respond to the initial broadcast, additional physical trauma is to be administered to the lore subject at 20-minute intervals until SCP-106 responds. Multiple lore subjects will be used in the case of major breach events. SCP-106 will typically enter a dormant state after finishing with a lore subject. In addition, subjects may... <laughs> Sometimes when he closed his withered eyelids, the old man could see the prairies of his youth, the moonlight grasses, feel and hear the gentle whispers of the wind against his flesh. But that had been long ago, hadn't it? Sometimes when he dreamed, he'd forget that he was old and leap through those fields, shrieking with the elemental joy of existence. There were others there, young, like he was in the dream, their faces blurry but so heartbreakingly familiar. It felt wrong to have forgotten them. Then he would wake again and see the corroded metal walls of his prison. Technically, he was not bound in this cell. He could leave at any time. He just had to get up and walk out. But beyond, the world had changed into something lunatic. Too bright, too complex. As though it had been designed to confuse and daze him. Burning white lights, random surfaces at dizzying intervals, so that the air seemed to drown or choke him. It had not been this bad when they first brought him to this dismal place. Or perhaps it was he who had changed, his faculties dispersing themselves into the suffocating walls. So here he stayed. He would try to take refuge in fantasy, losing the present as he had lost so much of the past. 
But those open prairies were becoming harder and harder to call up of his own volition. Instead, he found himself walking endless, twisted corridors, doors sagging with decay and dark, damp mold dripping from the ceiling. He wondered whether it was the ruin of his own mind he was imagining. He had been young once, he thought. He remembered his mother and siblings, though in his mind they had become mixed with his children, and how they had played amongst the trees and in the open prairies. He had been taught how to hunt in those days. Prey had been plentiful. No, not plentiful, he thought but easier to catch. His mother had brought him an old, tattered one, alive, to show him how to hunt. And he and his brothers and sisters batted and clawed at it until it shuddered and expired. Did it think? He wondered. Did it feel? Did it understand it was old and could no longer defend itself? Even then, his tribe had not been large. Never more than twenty. In those days, the prey were different. Their bones were long and thick. They had ridges over their eyes, and they wore the skins of other animals. Their teeth and claws were barely a threat to his tribe. But sometimes they had other teeth made of stone they could hold in their hands. Sharp, glittering things that tore your flesh. Then the prey had changed a smaller, scrawnier sort of prey, with more stone teeth than the others, so that, at first, the tribe still hunted the boneheads. The thinner prey hunted the boneheads too, though not for food, and between them, the supply dried up. This new sort of prey was harder to hunt and catch. Even back then, they sealed themselves in burrows, which gave way to hives with the horrible crisscrossing branches, exactly perpendicular to each other, that made his tribe's eyes water and their stomachs heave when they looked at them. And they had the burning light, like lightning but contained in a bundle of sticks. Still, they had prospered. He had found a mate. He found that if he tried hard, he could recall the curves of her body as they lay together and had children who ran wildly over the plains like he had. But the prey had grown ever further entrenched, and it seemed the more the prey swarmed together, the harder it was to get inside, to skip over into the twilight world that let them move through the walls and floors of their hives. They ringed their hives with running water. The first time he had burrowed into that, he remembered the mind-consuming movement, a taste of what the whole world would become. How had he been captured? He thought for a moment that he could no longer remember, until the outlines of a narrative suggested themselves into his mind. Was it true? Who could tell? He had been alone, perhaps for decades, the last member of his tribe. He could no longer recall whether it had been his mate or one of his offspring had vanished one day, like all the rest. He sometimes entertained himself with the thought that she was still alive, then wondered what that meant. He would not wish this disintegration, this incomprehensible confinement on her or any member of his tribe. He thought he could remember waking one day and feeling hungry, more hungry than he had ever felt in his entire existence. He had roused himself from near hibernation from the tree where he lived and descended. The prey's hive nestled in the shadow of a hill on the opposite side of the lake. The old man remembered it being far larger in his childhood. The prey drank it, he had realized one day long ago, and their teeming thousands depleted it. When it was dry, the prey would be gone, and then what would he do? He had approached 
moving over and through the dirt they had pockmarked with their tall gold seed, leeching the life out of it. The hive was bigger than he remembered and more dazzling, the luminescence the prey produced to light their way through the night. That had once belonged to his tribe, catching off big, flat, reflective surfaces that seemed profoundly unnatural. Just one, he thought. He just needed one of them. Then he could sleep again. He would find one of the caves the prey made under their hives and sleep. He shivered as he passed through cold yellow light. Here at the edge of the hive, they still had open areas around each burrow. Though they had grazed the grass so thoroughly, there was almost nothing left. He remembered seeing one of them small, tender in his mind's eye, and the old man drooled. He had watched it for days, waited for a moment when it left the safety of the pack. These days, precious few moments, they guarded their young so fiercely. Then, while it was running near its burrow, he took it, long arms closing around it, and fingers searing into its flesh. A twist practiced many, many times. And it was gone. He could not wait to hide. His hunger was too severe. His remaining teeth were already gnawing at the soft tissues of its nose and ears. Even as he hugged the small body to him and shrank into the shadows of the tree line. Then the light. Then the pain. The prey had found him hours later, eating what was left of the infant, and shown their brilliant light in his eyes. Blows fell on the old man, crushing him. He felt something pop in his arm. Something shiny was looped between his wrist and the tree, and they went away. He tried to retreat to the fields in his mind, but the cold iron kept him there. He had found a way to escape it later, but that was after they had put him in the cell, at the center of the maze. Then the white coats had come and taken him away, and the lights had grown brighter, and the pain more intense. No food, no food. He was dying, he thought distantly, starving one day at a time. When he had been young, he had seen an old man die of starvation. He had killed another member of the tribe, and no one would share their food with him. His limbs had hollowed out, and his skin had become like a dried leaf. For a long time, he had hoped that others of his kind would come and find him, save him from this humiliation, but they would not relieve his hunger, he knew. They would not share their food with him. He had become that old man and he had committed sin. He could not remember the reason he had fought the larger male. Times had become hard and prey scarce, and the other male had failed the tribe. It occurred to him later, the older male might have been his father. The old man remembered the onlookers, faces blurred and shifting, watching as he pummeled the larger male to the floor and put his hand in the other's skull and moved his fingers until there was no life in there anymore. But he had done no better, and his people had grown thinner and thinner and left him, one by one, to find richer hunting grounds elsewhere. Now he was alone, and as the years went by in the metal cell, he began to think an awful thought. I am the last. Once these bewildering creatures in white coats would not have confused him. His mind would have been clean and sharp, and he would have navigated the horrible labyrinth outside his cell once, but not now. Now he wandered alone in the crumbling steel darkness, the pain from his stomach overwhelming what was left of him. I have lost everything, he thought. I have lost 
everything. He twitched as he realized that in his distress, he had drifted further from his cell than he ever had before. Those decayed corridors of mind fell behind him, and he found himself in what he thought was the waking world, but nothing like the maze he had perceived before. Here, the air was so fresh, his old lungs exhaled suddenly, as though he had been submerged in ice. He was in a small, tunnel-like space, like the burrows of foxes or badgers, but hard-cornered and metal in the fashion of the prey. Below him were slats of light, and he realized dimly that through them he could see the world of the white coats, clean and clinical. But there was something wrong. Red lights were wheeling back and forth hypnotically. The white coats were running, rushing away to be replaced by others with blue hard hats and determined expressions. Then he smelled it. The scent of injured prey. So rich, so replete in memory, but so harrowingly distant that he wondered if he had imagined it like so much else. But no, there it was again. The old man stirred long black limbs and raised himself up as far as he could, his ragged nostrils sucking in the fresh, cold air. And his ears, dull as they were, picked up that long-forgotten cry, that gibbering assemblage of syllables, almost human as the prey called out in pain and fear. The dribble came thickly down his withered chin, and dry old eyes moistened again as he remembered marrow and blood soaking into pink, juicy meat, just like it had been in the old days. No doubt the white coats would take this morsel from him, as they had taken it away before. He didn't care. There was not enough left of the old man to care. He could only move down through the slats toward the light. The old man came drip, drip, dripping down the wall. SCP-106, The Old Man, was written by Dr. Gears, narrated by John Grills, with addendums by Vin Ernst. The Young Man was written by Dr. Gears and narrated by Addison Peacock. Once But Not Now was written by S. Regan and narrated by Tanya Muliovich. Our music was composed by the wonderful Tom Rory Parsons, and my name is Pacific Obadiah, your showrunner, sound designer, and guy who does stuff. Tom Owen is our producer, and this is a bloody disgusting show. For more information, go to bloody-disgusting.com. <laughs>